Hello, everyone. I am Daniel Dominguez, and I would like to say that as a Marine Corps veteran, it is an honor to be speaking at such a prestigious military academy, training our future service members. I will be speaking today on environmental justice, water resource issues, and some of the challenges that are occurring, and which will likely occur more prevalently in the future. But first, I would like to tell you a little bit more about my journey through life so far, so you can get a clearer idea of what has led me to devote myself to this field. I joined the Marine Corps on my 18th birthday, and I served a total of about six years as an aviation electronics technician. After boot camp and schooling, I was stationed at Miramar, California, where I focused on electronic countermeasures aboard fixed wing aircraft on everything from cargo planes to fighter aircraft. I was then selected to join the Presidential Helicopter Detachment, HMX-1, where I served as a quality assurance and work center supervisor under Presidents Barack Obama and briefly Donald Trump. After a lot of pondering, I decided to leave the Marine Corps due to the rediscovery of my love of learning. I was originally going to study biomedical engineering, but after a three month road trip and traveling across the US, Canada, Mexico, and Cuba, I decided to change to water resources as I gained a connection to the issue of visiting various national parks. The summer after my freshman year, I traveled to South Africa on a study abroad trip where I began to learn about international water issues and the disparity between rural communities and a large urban center in their access to water. Upon my return, I became a sustainable water fellow at the Colorado Water Center, where I worked with the leadership in my program and at the same Colorado Watersheds Conference to create scholarships for minorities to be able to participate in the planning of future water resource monitoring and education. Since then, I have worked as a field research assistant at Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks and locally in the Poudre River watershed, working with citizen science groups to help them monitor their natural resources. I recently finished a NASA remote sensing internship pairing citizen science data to satellite imagery. And in the future, I would like to focus on how we can use technology to monitor water resources and inform our policies surrounding these matters. I will continue to work in this field for the foreseeable future. I'd like to start talking about our present water situation in the US. The average American consumes 88 gallons of water per day. Between drinking it, showering, and other uses such as lawn care, car washing, etc. So your individual footprint can vary, but not by as much as you think. In the future, one third of states in the continental US face drought conditions as observed from NASA satellite imagery. There are over 1,500 community water systems, which are the local systems that deliver water from the source to your homes. And as of 2018, 40% of these are non-compliant with EPA regulations due to various reasons. Let's zoom in to some communities that are already facing water resource issues. The first is the Texas Colonia, where a family of eight uses an average 50 to 100 gallons of water per month which is drastically lower than that of the average American. The median income is $29,000 with a poverty rate of about 40% in a dominantly Hispanic community. Here, a lack of infrastructure and resources prevents connection to public water tap and the use of private wells leads to unreliable water quality. The larger colonias that do have pipe running water struggle to keep their necessary infrastructure financially operable. The colonias lie in between municipalities and outside of their jurisdiction, with priorities in their counties set by the cost per connection, which is much higher in these smaller sized communities. Next, we zoom to another predominantly Hispanic community in Cebo, California. Similar in medium income and poverty rate, the community has had their water contaminated by nearby agriculture. These towns are usually smaller under the control of counties, and the general plan stated that they were not worth the investment as they have little to no authentic future. This is where we begin to see that these are complicated issues. How do we sustain the agriculture that we all rely on without preventing others from having equal access to water? Although both of these communities have similar demographics, there's another factor that stands out in those already facing water issues. Although often minority communities are at risk due to lower income, the race does not mean you will have equal access to water. Poverty is a common denominator at the moment for the unequal access to water. In the Appalachians, the municipality broke down due to low income tax. Many of the households here 
are not connected to the sewage system, and contaminated runoff has become a prevalent concern for the local artisanal springs, which everyone relies on. Sometimes the creeks run black, which makes the residents worry of the runoff from nearby mining operations. Although the community loves their environment, they are also reliant on the income that the mining industry provides for the area. In the South, communities are facing sanitation issues. Houses there also struggle with draining their waste into sewage systems and the added difficulty of backflow when they are connected to a sewage system. Due to the saturation of the ground, meaning that the soil cannot retain any more water, sometimes sewage discharge is pulled at the top and residents have to live with the smell and possibly human health ramifications. Looking at these communities, it is easy to get a false sense of security. We often think that these issues can't happen in our water systems, especially because we are so close to such a large urban center. However, even the largest of cities have begun to struggle with water resource issues and providing clean water to all of their residents. Unlike what we have seen so far, we have a much higher medium income and a diverse population. After the Flint, Michigan water scare, the federal government launched the lead reduction program. With approximately 315,000 taps, the city will have to replace about a third of them. With a much higher average income, you wouldn't think we'd be struggling with these issues. But let's take a look at what led to this problem and why we're replacing our service lines in Denver. In 2014, the Flint Water Municipality changed their water source from Lake Huron to the Detroit River. In order to meet their smaller budget, and I'm sure you're all aware of what happened next, the lower pH of the water reacted with the lead pipes, eroding them and introducing the metal into homes. The city did not introduce an anti-corrosion chemical to protect the pipes, which would cost an estimated $140 per day. Now, this doesn't seem to be a lot of money, but when you're working with lower and lower budgets, it becomes hard to know where you can make the cuts and where you don't. And they hadn't needed to use these chemicals with their previous water source. So they did not correctly account for the needs in changing their water sources. Now again, 40% of these community water systems are not compliant with EPA regulations. The lead copper rule sets a 15 parts per billion as the upper limit of lead allowed in water sources. In the upper graph, we see when the lead became more than the allowed amount and that it didn't stay above that level for long. As a matter of fact, it seems to be on par with the rest of Michigan. So again, we have these complications of water issues. The water is safe, but now the public trust in the water municipality has become eroded to a point where people are preferring to drink water from plastic bottles, even though the water is safe now. Now, the local and federal governments have to regain the trust that they can provide clean water. I'm sure you're all probably thinking why we don't just use these anti-corrosion chemicals all over the country to fix our lead problem. But in water, we don't have a one-size-fits-all band-aid. Each situation has to be clearly analyzed. We have to consider all of the repercussions. After the government launched its plan to reduce lead exposures, one of the prevalent solutions was using orthophosphates, the anti-corrosion chemicals, to coat the metal pipes with a protective layer, but it's more complicated than that. If you look to the graph on the right, in nature, algae blooms are usually limited by their nitrogen and phosphorus inputs, but introducing more phosphorus in these chemicals will increase the possibility of algae blooms in water sources, which in the front range is already under threat due to our increasing populations. Our state originally wanted to implement this solution in our local water systems. However, in an unprecedented decision, Denver Water aligned with other municipalities and nonprofits to come up with another solution. They will willingly be replacing all that service lines located within the city to try and prevent the danger of algae blooms in our water sources. We have one third or about 75,000 lines to replace, which will take 15 years and the project will cost from 300 to $500 million. Although this is a preemptive measure, we're still asking those that are still in older homes, which are usually poorer households in Denver, to be at risk during that time. Coincidentally, some of these neighborhoods do happen to be predominantly minorities and low income households. 
as they are older neighborhoods with lower rent averages. The entirety of Denver households will see an average of $1 increase in their water bill while the project is underway, and those at risk will receive a free filter. The city will increase its pH in the meantime to protect them from leaching, but in other places in the country, the poor are still vulnerable as not everyone can afford to continuously buy water filters for their homes. In the past, Marine and other service members at Camp Lejeune suffered from contaminated water levels 240 to 3,000 times the safety limit. Although the military was not fully aware of the contamination levels until the early 80s, it still took them approximately four years to shut off groundwater taps. The dangerous chemicals had been linked to cancers and other diseases, with Congress having to pass an act to help the approximately 750,000 service members affected. However, to this day, there are still many struggling to file their claims through the legal and VA systems. Currently, the military is investigating water contamination from forever chemicals, which are common as fire retardants for aircraft and ships. The chemicals have begun to be found as carcinogenic, with these charges resulting in groundwater co contamination. Military firefighters are most risk due to direct exposure, but water contamination is potentially threatening to those that live in the surrounding area, especially children. You can see on this map how many discharges have been confirmed and those yet to be investigated. Not all of these will result in water contamination, but there's a likelihood some will. Now, I'm not telling you all of this to make you scared of water or your futures, but I think it's incredibly important that we all become aware of the issues we are facing and that we all consider how complicated these issues can quickly become. Many more people in industry and government are becoming aware of the challenges we will face in the future. And being aware of what is happening in your local area with your water, it's one of the best ways you, for you to be an advocate for your needs. Thank you all for joining me. I hope that you were able to at least learn a little bit about environmental justice and water resource issues in America.